We are very excited to help kick off Financial Inclusion Week. I'm Michael Schlein. I'm the CEO of Axion. I'm delighted to welcome Ajay Banga. In June of this year, Ajay began his five-year term as the new president of the World Bank. Uh, before that, he had worked at Citigroup and PepsiCo and General Atlantic, but most of us know him having run MasterCard for over a decade, where, among other things, he aimed to have the company bring in a billion people into the global financial system. He also created the Center for Inclusive Growth. He's been a strong advocate for financial inclusion. Ajay, I'm thrilled to welcome you here for a nice conversation. Thank you, Michael. So you and I spoke on the day that um, the president nominated you for the World Bank, and you were excited, you were thrilled, you were also, it was daunting. Uh, take us back to what was going on in your head that day. Exactly that, exciting, thrilling, but daunting. And that combination still persists. The exciting and thrilling part is that you have to pinch yourself when you walk into this office with a real chance to be leading one of these institutions that the Bretton Woods guys had created with a vision back then. And if you grew up doing economics honors in undergrad like I did in St. Stephen's College in Delhi, this is you know, really an opportunity of a lifetime. So I did, I pinched myself when I entered the office. And I think that is still very much part of the thrill. When you go out and you visit a field project mm. and you see women getting legal aid because of abuse or pension denial in a Peru, or you see stunting programs in Indonesia, or you see mangroves being planted, or ways to track schools and improve outcomes in India, it makes up for a lot. Mm. It makes up for a lot. It kind of tells you there's a, there's a real job to be done there by the beautiful people in this place. And then the daunting part is all the rest that comes with it. The tasks are much tougher. I think the challenges have got intertwined in really complicated ways. It's the perfect storm in some ways. And then you've got the whole challenge of governance and the challenges that multilateralism face in the world. I see it in my office every day, right? So those competing priorities, those challenges are here. That's the daunting part. You, from that day, you traveled all around the world before your nomination and then since. You must have gone to scores and scores of countries. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of a listening tour. What, what did you hear? So actually, before the election, I met 93 countries. Wow. Uh, presidents, prime ministers, finance ministers. I, uh, I met 100 plus civil society organizations. I met about 10 or 15 people from asset management companies and operators to see what the private sector's view was. And, and then it's continued since then. There's been G7 and G20 meetings. There's been ASEAN leaders. There's our annual meetings coming up. But then there's all the country visits in Latin America and Africa and in Asia. And in fact, I'm going back again in a little while to uh, Saudi, Jordan, and Egypt. What did I learn? I learned three basic things. Hmm. The first one is that there is a mistrust and a pulling apart between the global north and the global south at a time when there should have been a coming together. And the reason for that is manifold and many different pieces, but think of it this way. Uh, they feel that the rules on energy access don't apply similarly. Natural gas in different parts of the world is very much seen as a part of the gas transition. They, on the other hand, are told, so they believe, you should only do renewables, which is challenging. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they feel that their money for their growth and development uh, never really came through in the way it was meant to do. A hundred billion for climate change was promised, hasn't shown up. Yeah. They're told, you know, IDA, they look at the contributions to IDA and they're either flatlining or coming down and the only way the IDA numbers have gone up is the bank is leveraging its balance sheet. And it's reaching kind of the point where IDA leverageability gets challenging. They see that, and yet when a war erupts in Ukraine, money does appear and does get used. Now, they all understand that Ukraine is a line that has to be managed and dealt with, with the severity of attention that it deserves. But they're just looking at it from their eyes. Mm -hmm. And that's the contributing fact. So when you put all this together, you end up with this feeling that I'm getting left behind just when I should be getting oxygen. I have these young people coming into my workforce. I have a demographic dividend. That's only true if young people have quality of life when they're growing up, you know, clean air, clean water, education and health, and then a job. They don't get that. That's not a demographic dividend. That's a demographic challenge. 
So there's all that going on in their minds. And that, Michael, was probably the most disheartening part hmm. of the trip. The second part that does come across is that they love the bank for its knowledge, its capacity to help advise on regulatory changes, policy changes, bankable projects, how to focus on stunting, bring success from one country to the other, mm -hmm. things that you and I have done in our careers. Mm -hmm. Success transfer is very much a part of a leader's job. They love that. Would they like it to be delivered better? Would they like the different parts of the bank to work better together? Would they like the bank to deliver things quicker rather than slower? Also true, but they do like the knowledge part of the bank. And of course they like the money. <laughs> but, but, but once a country grows a little bigger, actually our contribution of money to their budget reduces in prominence, which means we're doing our job, actually. Mm -hmm. If anything, they should be getting out of business in a country eventually. Our knowledge shouldn't go out of business, but our banking should. And I think that comes across from them very clearly. Love the knowledge, love the money, but mm -hmm. can you do it faster? Can you do it seamlessly? Can you be one unit and not multiple units? And, you know, that kind of issue came up everywhere. I think that's pretty much the gamut. The people you meet on the ground, both in the client countries, as well as the organizations we partner with, and most importantly, the ones in our organization, are brilliant. You meet mm. people in this institution. You and I have worked together in the past. We thought we worked in an institution with amazing people. These guys are terrific. You were HR head there. You recognize talent. It's something you've done. This, you would love the talent in terms of their subject matter expertise and their devotion to their task. They could be elsewhere earning more money. They're here. Mm -hmm. And they've worked in multiple countries. So they fit all the bill of what you'd like. The question is, can we give them the leadership to liberate them to do all the right things we want the bank to do? Now, you're taking this position at an extraordinary moment in, in history. For decades, we've seen poverty go down and down and down until today, where for the first time in our lifetimes, it's going up. And at the same time, uh, we, we've also seen incredible digital access. So we have new tools mm -hmm. to reach people we've never been able to reach before. You put those two together, and the need for the World Bank is greater than ever, but you have some new tools. How do you, how do you tackle this moment? How do you get the World Bank to rise to this moment? So Michael, you and I did work on financial inclusion. You guys are very good at what you do. And Here's the funny part. The reason that poverty reduced for the prior three to four decades, mm -hmm. at the core, is the fact that millions and millions and tens of millions of jobs got created worldwide during that period. China went through its amazing growth story. India is growing through it as we speak. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh, Vietnam, Mexico, all these countries became a growth story of their own with jobs mostly to do with commodities and goods, but also to do with services, more and more. Mm -hmm. What happened in the last four or five years is that job growth engine has slowed. In fact, in some cases, has positively reversed because of COVID, fragility, climate change, all those things. So I think the best way to get back onto the right trajectory is to energize jobs for young people. To do that, digital, and digital technology is critical for multiple reasons. For entrepreneurs, it's a way to get access to credit, to insurance. Things that you understand well, you mm -hmm. put them onto a bank account, you get them the right identity, open the account seamlessly, use their transactions to build a credit history or an insurance history, and you know, lo and behold, you can actually make a difference to the life of a small merchant or a small business. The same is true of the individual. You get them into the system, mm -hmm. they build a history, they become you know, eligible for a loan or insurance and their lives change. But inclusion, therefore, is not just opening an account. It's what you do with it, mm -hmm. the histories you build, what access that gives you. So it's, it's access and usage that is the magic mantra in inclusion. And I think that combined with jobs and focusing on jobs is kind of where we have to go. Entrepreneurs employ people but so do other forms of jobs, services jobs and agricultural jobs and food processing jobs and back offices and you know, you know this well. Mm -hmm. I think digital technology is critical for all of those, education, 
access to these kinds of opportunities. One of the things that you and I spoke about many years ago is that incumbency gives an advantage to those who are there earlier because the barriers to entry create you know, a difficult time for others to come in. Digitization explores those barriers and enables uh, entry of new companies, new businesses, new models, uh, takes out the rent seekers. It does all the right things. And so done well, managing the cybersecurity, managing the privacy, mm -hmm. but done well, this is the ultimate breakthrough tool. It's very exciting. You, you've spoken uh, about uh, the goal of eradicating poverty on a livable planet. Talk about financial inclusion and poverty in the world of uh, growing climate crisis. Yeah, so that comes back to our original conversation about intertwined challenges and the perfect storm. So I think this idea that somehow you can solve for poverty without solving for climate change or pandemics or fragility and refugees, I think that's a false argument. And I was given this explanation the other day to somebody, but if, you, you know, if you're in Kenya and you're a farmer and you don't get rain for four years, which by the way is the case, this is the fifth year of poor rainfall, what happens is you no longer have two crops or three. When you reduce that by one cycle, you now no longer can afford the cattle that you kept, which means you're no longer going to earn the money from the dairy which means you can no longer afford the farm laborer, which means you bring your children back from school to work on the farm. And which child do you get first? The girl child. Everything we talked about, yeah. changing the cycle of poverty, empowering the girl, educating her, taking her out of the cycle where she gets married at an early age and has four babies by the time she's 20, the way to change that is to educate her and to give her a chance, a fair shake. So climate change just destroyed all that progress with that one girl and that one family. And I think that's the important issue here, that these are intertwined, interrelated, interconnected, almost causal from one another, but quite there. That, I think, is the most important aspect. And that's why I'm trying to say, yes, we're in the business of eradicating poverty. Haven't taken our eyes off that ball. But it has to be on a livable planet where you can breathe the air, drink the water, get access to education, get access to health care. These are human rights, basic human rights. And gender equality, as Secretary Clinton said, is a basic human right. So, you know, these things cannot be given up for the other. And so that's the way I think about these being intertwined. We have to put money to work at the junction points of these challenges. So with that in mind, what will we see coming out of the World Bank on climate? So to me, the climate part of this uh, requires four or five areas of attack. Mm -hmm. uh, one area of attack is you know, adaptation and resiliency for those countries that are most impacted by what's happening with climate. So take a Caribbean island or a Pacific island or drought or things of that nature. Not just poorer countries. Look at what happened in New York City a few days ago. So we're all living this need for adaptability and resilience building infrastructure the right way, building the right water sinks, raising the level of roads and bridges, you know, resiliency in all forms. It's difficult to see private sector financing in that very easily because the business model to get paid back is unclear in most countries. Then there's mitigation. Now the fact is that what you need to do is we cannot have an energy intensive growth model in the future of the type that we enjoyed the last four decades. We just can't. We'll never make it to 2050. So the only way that you can change that is by focusing on a few of the middle income countries that are going to grow through growth bursts and their consumption of energy will boom during that period, as it should. The question is, can you change the form of energy that's produced and used so that you can bend the curve in those countries? It's not 50 countries, it's 20. There, I think you can get the private sector to be a fairly strong player because the cost per unit of renewable energy is now lower than the cost per unit mm. of fossil fuel. It just takes a little longer to get going, and so you need to figure out how to take some of the risks out. But private sector money with proven technology and proven scale is ready to enter that space in these limited numbers of countries. That's what our private sector lab is trying to do. And then there is the issue of water. 
You can call water part of adaptation. I think it's a whole thing by itself. Hmm. I think that the level of water stress in the world is much higher than we understand. And if you look at large countries like China and India, there is a water shortage today. Wow. But that's where three billion people live. Hmm. If three billion out of seven, just two countries, have water challenges today, let's just discuss the others. Where is the world's maximum of fresh water? In America, Canada, some in Brazil, Russia, and a little bit in Africa, parts of Africa. Where are the populations? Not where that fresh water is. So we have to think about where and how water management, water recycling. Look at Singapore's leading example in recycling water. Now, it's a tiny country. They know how to do things well. We have to do that at scale in many countries. Water management to me is a whole third topic. And a fourth topic to me is the whole issue of how do you start thinking about diverting money to the global south in a way that's not a carbon tax. So a lot of people talk about carbon taxes and that you know you should pay a carbon tax on your consumption and that money should go into a pool and probably come to an institution like the World Bank and other such institutions and mm -hmm. then the money gets put into the countries that need to manage the downstream effects of climate change. That sounds great until you convert it to the politics that says, effectively, I want a citizen living in, in Missouri paying for having to put money into a country in Africa. And I think that's a very hard political sell. Mm -hmm. Forget about decency and the desire of that individual. I have no doubt they care, but I don't know how you sell that politically. And so a different way to think about it is, if you were to create voluntary carbon markets that people have been talking about, but have not really moved the way they should mm -hmm. for various issues around the accounting of the carbon credit and greenwashing and all kinds of criticism. Mm -hmm. Good criticism, deserved criticism, mm -hmm. but if you can do it the right way. So we're currently doing an audit of 14 countries end to end, so they cannot reforest here and deforest there, mm. but you've got to check the whole jurisdiction and do an audit. And if those countries then get that done, and if you can use those credits with the seal of good housekeeping, from institutions like ours, mm -hmm. not just us alone, but like ours, and then create a voluntary carbon market where even $10 a ton, $5 a ton, it changes how money flows to those who have forests, sun, and wind, mm -hmm. which happens to be the global south. So I think climate change is, you know, there's a lot to think through. Mm -hmm. There's adaptation with the private sector, less likely, our money, more likely. Need to leverage it up, need to get more concessional finance in. Challenging. There's the middle income countries for mitigation, mm -hmm. where you know you can get the private sector to play a bigger role. We probably need to take some role in risk mitigation. That's still challenging, but work to be done. Then there's all these other things around water. And then finally, there's the issue of resource management through things like a voluntary carbon market. And all this, by the way, what's the underlying bedrock of all this? A trillion and a half, close to it, is the IMF numbers goes into fuel and agricultural subsidies in the world that are seen to be harmful for the environment, either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. That harm costs another six trillion a year. That's seven and a half trillion dollars a year. Wow. If we can repurpose billions of that, we begin to move the needle. Uh, macro question. We're at a, a bit of a precarious time. The emerging markets, some of them are struggling, some of them people are beginning to think that some may default. Um, how do you see that landscape? And of course, as countries falter, it's the poor that gets hit the hardest. How do you, how do you navigate the next year? Uh, the debt issue is serious. Yeah. And uh, wishing it away ain't going to work. <laughs> and uh, the reality is that the G20 has a pretty good framework for trying to work through the debt issue. It does require transparency of the debt, which means how much actually was borrowed by this country, from whom, with what terms and conditions and covenants, with what kind of repayment schedule. The problem has been that data has not been transparently available, largely mm -hmm. because some of the deals struck with bilateral creditors were cloaked in confidentiality clauses. Mm. Uh, having said that, Zambia recently announced when we were in Paris some time back 
that they were able to come to a negotiated settlement with all the creditors there, the bilaterals, and then the commercial creditors have to agree to the same haircut. So yeah. it did work, and countries were usefully engaged. And you know, everybody from the Paris Club to China to India all participated in this dialogue, along with the IMF and the World Bank. The IMF and the World Bank have a sovereign debt roundtable, which the IMF takes the lead on, but we are right there with them. That's the nature of how it should be. Mm -hmm. And the idea is we're going to meet again in Marrakesh to not only solve for these problems, but to learn so that we try and avoid doing it again. <laughs> Although, good luck with that one. And I think when you combine those two topics together, there is hard work to be done to get some of these countries out of it. I think the rising interest rates, strengthening mm -hmm. dollar, these are all big challenges for some of those who took debt at a time when it probably was much cheaper and it felt like mm -hmm. it would say cheap forever. The one thing you've got to remember about financial markets, they never do what you think. And so planning for the downside was not done. That's an error. And we need to get better at doing this when we go forward. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's one thing people forget. Some of these countries may today not be able to afford the debt, Michael, that is true. But if the loans that were given to them by whoever gave them were 30, 40 year loans priced hmm. appropriately, that country 30, 40 years from today with the right regulatory policies and economic growth, that debt may not feel as crazy. Hmm. Today it feels it. So if the, the lending were long term enough, mm -hmm. if the political sort of capability was there and the regulatory capability was there to pull that country in the right direction, and if the pricing of all this was right, that's a lot of ifs. If that happens, some of these countries, if anything, should be getting access to the right kind of funding to transform their societies. It, it's a different way of thinking <laughs> about the problem, but there are too many ifs in it, so this is not easy. Today you're speaking to a global audience of financial inclusion leaders who are operators, investors, regulators, uh, think tank researchers. Uh, what do you want to see from this community? What, what more do you want to see? or, or what less do you want to see from us? <laughs> uh, I think what we need is a willingness to embrace the fact that these challenges have got much more complicated mm. because of the intertwined nature of them. Simple solutions will not work. So for example, saying that you can only do this and not that, and then taking that as a rigid position, because that's what suits your specific organization or the country you come from. We're kind of in this little planet together and we're going to have to give a little and take a little to work our way out of the hole we've dug over the last 40, 50 years. And I worry that extreme positions of rigidity, of belief that you know what you're doing and nobody else does, those are not helpful, Michael. What's really helpful is the willingness to embrace you know, moving things along and putting runs on the board because time's running out, and I think that's the second part. The urgency of time mm -hmm. needs to be in people's minds as they go along, and I think that would be helpful. I would, the only thing I would encourage doing less of is uh, don't criticize good ideas just because they don't look perfect. Mm -hmm. Done is better than perfect in today's environment. You may make some errors along the way, but if your direction of trajectory is the right one, then try and reduce the errors and move people in that direction. Again, because time's running out. And we seem to be getting into log jams, right? And that log jam is not useful. I want to end on a positive note. Um, you travel all around the world. What gives you hope? What makes you optimistic these days? Young people. Tell me. Everywhere. You go to India and you see young people, you see a smile on their face, you see them working in hotels, at a data center, in a factory, driving a bus, tourist business, all of these. You see them, you see their energy, and you listen to them, and you go to Africa, and you see them in Ethiopia, and you see them in Nigeria, and you see them in Cote d'Ivoire, and their energy and their optimism is pretty cool. They just need a level playing field, and they will hit that ball out of the park. We just owe them the level playing field. 
Ajay, thank you for taking the time and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.